Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India lecture on DC analysis and its applications to optimization. Um, DC analysis, what does DC mean? DC stands for difference of convex. So DC functions are functions which can be expressed as a difference of two convex functions and they are generally non-convex. As we are going to see, uh, there are a lot of non-convex function which uh, can be expressed as a difference of two convex functions. So, the use of DC functions, DC analysis, is in non-convex analysis. It means uh, looking at uh, non-convex problems with convex eyes, using convex tools in a non-convexity setting. Uh, this is a very typical attitude in mathematics. Differential calculus, what is it? You are linearizing functions, so you are applying linear methods in a non-linear setting. Look at uh, non-smooth analysis, what is it? You have non-differentiable functions, but you are using sort of derivatives, substitutes for derivatives. So again, you are looking at the non-differentiable uh, world with differentiable eyes. So here we are looking at the non-convex world with convex eyes. Um, so you can see here the title is uh, is basically an outline of my lecture. I will first present some uh, general results on DC functions, very elementary. Then uh, some subdifferential analysis, some applications to duality in optimization, and finally uh, I will present a result related to Lipschitz continuity of uh, DC functions and I will conclude by presenting the main references I have used to prepare this uh, lecture. Well in the first part of my talk uh, we will be dealing with uh, functions defined on Rn. In the last part I will consider the more general case when the space is a Banach space. But here to simplify the presentation uh, we just consider that we have a function f defined on a non-empty convex subset of Rn and we call it dc, as I said before, difference of convex, if it can be written on omega, on the domain, as a difference of two convex functions. Now I have a small question. I want to know, uh, it, is, it is clear that the number, amount of dc functions is quite abundant. Yes, we will see this later. Uh, of course, you have taken omega as a subset of Rn. Yes. Could be a convex, uh, naturally a convex subset of Rn. Suppose I take f from Rn to Rn, means both uh, g and h are from Rn to Rn. Uh, is that class of functions also abundant? Um, yes, 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 I think so. Uh, you are looking at vector functions which components are dc. Since uh, it's since for scalar functions we have this abundance, in fact it translates into. Oh, I'm not talking about that. If you are talking of from, from instead of omega, if you have Rn there, means f is from Rn to R. Yeah. Is then also you have uh, a lot of DC functions, it is abundant, right? Yeah, in the space of finite valued functions on Rn. Yeah, it is abundant. Yeah, I mean when, yeah, the same as here. In the general case, when I say there are a lot of non convex functions, I mean non-convex functions which are finite valued on omega. In particular, omega can be a rn and then the abundance is relative to the larger set of functions you are considering. Well, this is the notion we are going to use all the time, but there is also a local notion. We say that a function f is dc at a point in the domain if it is dc on some convex neighborhood of the point more specifically on the intersection of some convex neighborhood of the point with, uh, with the domain. And we say that a function is locally dc if it is dc at every point, which means at every neighborhood there is a decomposition, but 
in principle, there may not be a common decomposition for all the neighborhoods. Nevertheless, there are two important theorems uh, by Hartmann, published in 1950. I will give the precise reference at the end. The first theorem says that in the case when the domain of the function is either open or closed, and convex, of course, then there is no difference between locally DC and DC, and globally DC. I mean, whenever you are sure that at every point there is a neighborhood with a DC decomposition, you can also be sure that there is a global decomposition. Although the proof is not uh, constructive, so it, this result doesn't tell you how to obtain a global DC decomposition out of the local DC decompositions of the functions. Um, the same applies to the next theorem, also due to Hartmann in the same paper, which uh, basically says that when you compose DC functions, you get another DC function. Here is the precise result. You have a vector function y, which is DC component-wise. And you have another function g, which is a scalar valued, and it is dc. OK, assuming that the domain of the vector function is either open or closed, and the domain of the scalar function is open, then the composition is dc. Again, this result is not constructive. It assures you that the composition is dc, but doesn't tell you how to get a decomposition out of the composition of the functions y and g. But using this result, you can prove that a number of functions are dc. For instance, you have here two examples. The product of two dc functions is dc. Here is the proof. Apply the present theorem to the vector function y, whose components are f1 and f2, and consider g be the function y1 times y2, which is this dc as clearly shown by this decomposition. Okay, Then applying the theorem, you get that the product is dc. The reciprocal of a positive function f is uh, dc. Uh, it follows again by applying that uh, theorem to the case when y is um, is the vector function, uh, which uh, in this case it is a scalar and coincides with f, and g is the function 1 over y, which is convex for y positive. So we, 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 uh, we see that the class of DC functions is rather rich. It's closed under, well, obviously under the operation of addition, subtraction, multiplication by real numbers, and now we have just seen is closed under uh, multiplication. Also, the reciprocal of a DC function is DC. And we see here that the maximum of a finite collection of DC functions is uh, DC. And the, the short and easy proof you can see here is, in this case, constructive. It's very easy. If for each function, fi, you have a decomposition as a difference of two convex functions, gi and gi, then here you have at the end a decomposition of the maximum of those functions as a difference of two convex functions. This function and that function are convex because what we are doing is just adding convex functions, which preserves convexity, and taking the maximum of a collection of functions, which uh, um, preserves convexity too. So here we know how to obtain a decomposition of the maximum out of decompositions of the individual functions that enter into this maximum. One can obviously do the same for the point-wise minimum of a finite collection of functions. I stress the fact that is point-wise maximum or point-wise minimum of a finite collection because the result fails to be true. Not only the proof, but the result is, I would say, obviously wrong if we consider an infinite collection of functions. Uh, supremum of an infinite collection of DC functions need not be DC. Well, in particular, we have a specific decomposition for the positive part and the negative part 
of uh, a DC function. Uh, positive part is the maximum, and negative part is the maximum of minus the function and zero. Because we are taking the maximum of two functions, then applying the preceding result, we get this uh, decompositions for the positive part and for the negative part. And of course, the functions appearing in this decomposition are convex because we are taking the maximum of two convex functions. Going to be very soon, in some cases, it's very useful to have a decomposition which is uh, not only uh, a difference of two convex functions, but a difference of two convex functions which are also non negative. And it is shown here that you can always achieve that. I mean, if you give me two convex functions, I can find two convex functions which are moreover non-negative and whose difference is the same as the original function. To do this, just you simply need to consider uh, an affine minoran for each of the two functions. It always exists if the function is proper. For a proper convex function, you always have an affine minoran. And then just rewrite g minus h in this way. It's clear that after simplification, this is equivalent to g minus h, that is to say to f. But all the functions in this expression, which are written between parentheses, are convex. Because what are we doing? We are taking the maximum of two convex functions, and the only subtractions, which you can see here, the function which is subtracting is affine. And Subtracting an affine function doesn't destroy uh, convexity. Why is this decomposition with the extra condition of non-negativity useful? Because using such decompositions, in some cases, as in the one we will see here, you can construct explicit decompositions for some uh, operations with functions, for instance, the product. Suppose you have here two functions, f1 and f2 which are dc, and the decompositions we have for them have this extra property of non-negativity. Okay? Then we can expand the product in this way. And in this algebraic sum, every term is uh, the product of two non-negative convex functions. Since they are non-negative, each product, for instance, the first term, g1 times g2, can be expressed in this way as a difference of two convex functions explicitly. But it's essential that g1 and g2 are non-negative, because otherwise raising to the square would destroy convexity. So you have here a situation in which uh, having uh, the composition with not only convex, but also non-negative functions is uh, useful. Here you have an easy example. Here you have an example of application of the preceding uh, technique. The function of two variables, x, y, x over y, with y, with y positive. This is the product of two functions. x is one of the factors, and the other is 1 over y. Both are convex, but x is not non-negative. So we have to decompose it as a difference of two non-negative functions. And uh, using this decomposition, uh, the technique I have shown here, then after some obvious calculations, we end up with this expression for x over y as a difference of two convex functions. As I said before, the space of DC functions is rather large. It contains the class of all C2 functions, even more, the class of all so-called C11 functions. C11 stands for functions which are local ellipses and have uh, functions which are differentiable and have a local ellipses gradient. In particular, C2 functions are C11. So the larger space of C11 function is contained in the space of the C functions on omega. Yeah, actually, it's uh, C2 functions. Uh, this is a proof for the C11 functions, right? Yes. I will comment on the proof now. Uh -huh. I think I saw about the C2 functions, I learned it from a book by Huang Tui. They said that uh, C2 functions are always DC. Yes. 
but this is okay this is from the omega right okay, okay. well for for the class of c2 functions in fact the proof is simpler than even simpler than what i have here uh, the proof is as follows take a compact neighborhood of the of a point okay at a given point you take a convex neighborhood thank you very much uh, then on that uh, neighborhood the second derivative is bounded from below yeah. okay, yeah, okay. Compact by a by a positive number then yeah. okay you can use this to express the function as a difference of a convex function minus a multiple of the square of the norm and then you have that the function is locally dc and by Harman theorem it is globally dc so this is a very simple proof for c2 functions but for c11 functions the proof is not difficult and it, it's here given a point in the domain you can take a compact convex neighborhood of that point then you have the Lipschitz condition you have a common constant k which works for all points in this neighborhood and then look at these inequalities the first one is just uh, Cauchy's bars the second is the Lipschitz condition and then we end up with this inequality which can be rewritten like this uh, but what we have here is the gradient of g this function f plus k halves the square of the norm on u then this inequality what is telling us is that the gradient of g is monotone but this is equivalent to saying that the function is convex so this function f which is g minus k halves the square of the norm on u is dc because both g and the square of the norm are dc so we have the uh, dc condition at the point x0 and then uh, because of Harman theorem the function is globally dc no i have one comment to make yes i'm just trying to figure out the kappa that k that you have used that k is positive of course because that's a Lipschitz yes, strictly value. positive yes you know this is an interesting thing and this f is a class of functions called weakly convex functions introduced by uh, yes jp vial i know in 1983 yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we are proving that every C11 function is actually weakly convex. Locally. Locally, yes. Locally. Locally. I mean, Harman theorem doesn't tell you that if you have this weak convexity condition locally, yeah. you have it globally. Oh, that is the interesting point, yeah. That is, that is the interesting point. I want yeah. To, yeah, thank you. This is an important difference. Yeah. Okay. So we have here the proof. Also, we have here uh, the statement that um, the space of DC functions is the smallest space of functions which contains all convex functions. So it contains all convex functions, all concave functions, and is the smallest subspace which contains those uh, functions. Then it is clear that this set of DC functions on omega is very large, but not as large as I could we could imagine every DC function must satisfy several properties which are listed here first of all they must be locally Lipschitz because every convex function is locally Lipschitz and when you take differences this locally Lipschitz character is preserved second there is an old result by Alexandrov which says that every convex function at every at almost every point in the same of the Lebesgue measure has a second order Taylor expansion. We know by Rademacher theorem that uh, convex functions are being locally Lipschitz are differentiable almost everywhere but the result by Alexandrov says more. There is not only a gradient everywhere almost everywhere but also almost everywhere there is a matrix which plays the role of the Hessian matrix this but matrix it, but it a of x0 it, it need not be the Hessian in particular because the function may even fail to be differentiable on a neighborhood so even if the gradient does not exist in on that particular neighborhood you uh, can be sure that there is a matrix which would play the role of the Hessian matrix I, I would like to remit slightly more. This this uh, is in Rockefeller's book also, Rockefeller and Wets. But I would like to be. I like to understand it slightly more. If I take a, can I take a minute? Of course. Yeah. For almost every x naught, 
there exists a there exists grad of f x naught, which is of course true. Because this is Rademacher's theorem for convex functions. Yeah, for yeah. And a symmetric m cross m matrix such that this holds. But I cannot prove that this matrix because if I define second order differentiation of a function, well, if 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 the Hessian exists, it must coincide with this matrix. Yeah. Of the okay, that's okay, okay. okay but the, the Hessian need not be strict. Even more, the function need not be differentiable around the point. Around the point x naught need not be. Or it may be, but not be twice differentiable. So okay. in these two cases, okay. there is no Hessian matrix, but there is one matrix. So of course, if it is twice differentiable, then it is Hessian. So you are just not okay, okay, right, right. So then it is a very powerful error. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this uh, statement was for convex functions, but of course it translates to differences because uh, I mean one can easily see uh, that this almost everywhere property is uh, also satisfied in that case. Well, then uh, we have a third property that uh, since convex functions have one-sided directional derivatives everywhere, the same must happen for every DC function. We are just subtracting two convex functions. And uh, the last result on this page says that every DC function is DC on every straight line, on every segment, let's say, contained in the domain of the function. Okay? But the converse is not true. There is a counterexample showing that a function. The converse is true in only the convex case. Right? The converse is true. The converse is true in the convex case. So for convex is if and only if. But for DC, no. There is some example showing that a function may have uh, all the restrictions to straight lines, DC, without being DC. By the way, the result I presented before about uh, the uh, inclusion of the C11 set into the DC set is true in finite dimensions. Thus proof, that proof does not apply in the infinite dimensional case and there is a counter example also showing that uh, the result does not go through in the, in the infinite dimensional case. Okay, these are the general uh, properties about uh, DC functions. Now I move to the uh, next uh, topic which is uh, duality. First for unconstrained optimization problems and then we will consider uh, constrained optimization. Um, I start by presenting a formula which was obtained by Pszczenizny a uh, long time ago, 41 years ago and rediscovered by Elaya and Iriart Ruti sometime later. Um, in fact, it's very easy to prove this formula. One can give a, a very simple algebraic proof of this formula for the conjugate of a difference of two functions in terms of the conjugates of the functions which uh, are involved in, in, in this difference, g and h. Uh, look at this dot below the minus sign here. If what it means is that in case that you subtract plus infinity, minus plus infinity, by definition, you take take the difference to be equal to plus in, to minus infinity sorry uh, on the other hand when the dot is above the sign this means the opposite convention that plus infinity minus plus infinity is equal to plus infinity uh, why why have you put x star equal to 0 where, where are you putting this set of uh, I, I, I will come to this in 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 a few seconds First, some comments on the on the first formula. Okay, this is an expression for the conjugate of a DC function, but actually to prove it, I said there is a very simple purely algebraic proof. You only need H to be convex. G can be an arbitrary function, but for H you have to assume that it is uh, convex, proper and lower semi-continuous. With this assumption, the proof is an exercise, a very easy exercise. Now, in this particular formula, now I come to, to your question, uh, take x star to be equal to 0. Then you have the conjugate of our DC function at 0. And the conjugate of a function at 0 is minus the infimum of the function. So for x star equals to 0, this left-hand side here reduces to minus this infimum. 
and when you take x star equal to 0 in this expression, then you get this infimum up to a minus sign. So this result, which is known as tolerant Zinger duality, because they obtained the result independently, uh, essentially at the same time, but with more complicated methods, uh, this result is an immediate consequence of the formula for the conjugate of a DC function. In fact, we are all the time considering finite valued functions, but we consider also extended real valued functions, in which case the formula still holds true if you put the dot over the minus sign here, as it is on the right hand side. This is a duality if, result, yes? Uh, x star equal to 0 is put on the right hand side of the formula on the first line. Yes. Then I would have soup y star element of Rn g of y star minus h star of 0. Yeah, this with some um, minus sign, huh, which uh, comes out uh, the transforming the supremum with the infimum. Huh, no, so it should, why shouldn't it have h star of 0 because you are putting h, a, x star is equal to 0. No, okay, I have made a change of variables. You would obtain here, wait a moment. Well, thank you very much for noticing this because this formula is not correct. X star should be Y star. Exactly, it should be Y star. X star should be Y star. Thank you for pointing this out. X star is Y star. Yeah, otherwise this term would be and a constant, would right. not then be depending on Y star. No, no, this, that's a, this is an important correction. The real formula is with Y star. And then it is okay. a y, y star is dummy, so you replace it. Yeah, so yeah, 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 exactly. So thank you for pointing out this this type. Okay, this is a duality result, uh, very well known in, in non-convex optimization, but it's not, it's a non-standard duality result because in convex optimization, we are used to dualities in which infimum of the primal problem is equal to the supremum of the dual problem. Minimization, maximization. Here, both are minimization problems. So the use is very different as in classical convex duality. But nevertheless, solving the dual uh, helps uh, solving the primal. And moreover, as we will see now, and moreover, this is an involution in the sense that the dual of the dual is the primal. So look, for computing the dual, you simply take conjugates and exchange, reverse the order. Okay? Then if you do this operation to the dual, then you get the primal because g star star is g and h star star is h. If you assume that both g and h are proper convex and lower semi-continuous. Well, as I said before, solving the dual problem has helps to solve the primal problem because if you have an approximate optimal solution of the dual problem, epsilon optimal solution, x star, you just need to take a subgradient of the conjugate of g star at this epsilon optimal point to get an epsilon optimal solution of the primal problem. Um, we have a formula for the conjugate and uh, we also want to obtain a formula for the subdifferential of a DC function. Uh, okay, one comment is in order. First, we are thinking the conjugate of a function which is not necessarily convex we can. The definition is uh, applicable to any function, no matter that it's convex. So the properties are not so nice if the function is not convex. Same with the subdifferential. The Fenchel subdifferential does not need uh, the function to be convex. But there are some problems if, you are, if your function is not convex. First problem is that this subdifferential may be empty at many, many points. And the second problem is that Okay, looking at the definition of the Fenchel subdifferential, the, you, you see that it's a global definition. You, you need to know the function everywhere. But when the function is convex, the subdifferential is closely related to the di directional derivative, for the computation of which you only need local information. So for convex function, the definition is just local. This is not the case in general for non-convex functions. So if you uh, consider the subdifferential of a DC function, uh, take into account that it may be empty at many points, first thing, and second, that you need full information of the function, not just local, to, to compute it. Well, uh, to give a formula for the subdifferential of a DC function, 
one needs to consider this operation star difference is called sometimes uh, of two subsets of Rn it was introduced by Pshenizhny uh, in that same paper which is mentioned here so it's a set of points such that if you translate uh, the second set B following this uh, vector x then the translate is a subset of A okay so the set of all those translate translations is the star difference. Uh, equivalently, we can easily see that uh, the star difference is this intersection. Um, this star difference may be empty very frequently because for the non-emptiness, we need the existence of a translate of B, which is a subset of A, and very often such a translate will not exist or from another point of view we are making a key uh, here intersection with a large collection of functions of, of sets one uh, set for each element in B so we are intersecting so many sets that we may uh, have an, an, an empty set but nevertheless we don't care this difference may be empty what we easily see looking at this expression is that this star difference has many nice properties Every property of A which is preserved under translations and intersections will be held by the star difference because we are just doing translations and intersections. So if A is convex, this, the star difference will be convex no matter how regular or irregular B is. The same with closeness. If A is closed, then the star difference with whatever B will be closed. Or if A is bounded, the star difference with B will be bounded no matter how. Now we are in a position to study the uh, subdifferential of a DC function. But first let us make a conjecture and let us see if it works. What the expression for the subdifferential of a DC function should be. To get some inspiration, let us consider first the easy case when the difference of the two convex functions turns out to be convex. We will find a formula for the difference in that case and then we will see if this formula extends to the general case. So assuming that f is convex then we have this relation between three convex functions g, f and h and because of the additivity of the subdifferential we have this equality. But we are assuming that we know the subdifferential of g and the subdifferential of h and with this data we want to compute the subdifferential of f. In other words, from this equality, we from this equality we want to deduce the value of this term. We want to solve this equation with this unknown. This is an equation of this type with three sets. X is the unknown, A and B are data. So, how can we solve this equation? We are dealing with convex convex compact sets. Subdifferentials are convex and compact. So, first of all, we have to recall the so-called cancellation property for, for closed convex sets, complex compact sets. If you have this equality a1 plus b equal to a2 plus b, then we can cancel out b and deduce that a1 is equal to a2. One can prove this cancellation law very easily using the separation theorem or even more directly taking support functions because the support function of the sum is the sum of the support functions. And since our sets are compact, these support functions are finite valued everywhere. Then you can cancel out just using the standard arithmetic. And then you end up with the equality of the support functions of A1 and A2, which is equivalent to the equivalence between the sets, if the sets are convex and closed. Okay? Now, once uh, we know this property, consider the equation we want to solve. From the very definition of the star difference, we uh, get that if x is a solution, we are assuming that a solution exists. So if we have a solution for this equation, this solution x must be a subset of the star difference. Now from this inclusion, we get this one simply by adding a to both sides. x plus a is contained in this set plus a, which is a subset of b because of the definition of the star difference. Okay? 
but we are assuming that x is a solution of the equation, so x plus a must be equal to b. All the inclusions here are actually equalities. In particular, the first one is equality. Then we use the cancellation property to cancel a, and then we conclude that the solution of our equation is the difference, but the start difference. I mean, uh, we proceed like in standard arithmetic, moving a to the right hand side with difference, but with this special difference. Okay. So, in this particular case, assuming that f is convex, we have that the subdifferential of the difference is the start difference of the subdifferential. But convexity was essential in this proof at this step. We need convexity to use the additivity of the subdifferential. Now the question is, does this formula hold in the general DC case? Of course, the proof doesn't hold, but maybe the formula holds true in the more general case. But the answer is no. Consider, for example, the case when the two functions are differentiable. In this case, the subdifferential reduced to the gradient. If that formula were true, then we would, ha we would have that the subdifferential of f is the start difference of these singletons. But for singletons, there is no difference between the start difference and the ordinary difference. They coincide. So we would have the singleton of the different of the gradients, which is the gradient of the difference. But in particular, it would be non-empty everywhere. And non-emptiness of the subdifferential everywhere means the function is convex. So the conclusion would be, if that formula would hold true in the general case, every function, which is the difference of two differentiable convex functions, would be convex. And this is obviously true obviously not true. Uh, there is also another argument, uh, maybe even more elementary. Look this expression again. In the right hand side we are dealing with convex functions. So to compute the subdifferentials we only need local information. But on the left hand side if the function is DC we cannot do it with just local information. Well, so the true formula is this one, which is more complicated you need to consider epsilon subdifferentials. The definition for the epsilon subdifferential is here. And it's worth pointing out that epsilon subdifferentials, even for convex functions, require global information. With just local knowledge, you cannot compute them. Okay, so you have to take a start difference of the epsilon subdifferentials and then the intersection over all positive or non-negative epsilon. And also this formula has a more general version for epsilon subdifferentials. It basically says if here you write the epsilon prime subdifferential, you just add epsilon prime here, and that's it. This is what this formula is saying. Uh, using uh, that formula for the epsilon subdifferential, we can immediately deduce the global optimality condition for uh, DC functions, which was obtained by Iriar Turuti in 1989. Although, um, since the formula for the subdifferential of a difference was not known at that time, the derivation of the optimality condition is not as simple in the, in the initial paper by Iriar Turuti. The derivation using that formula is as simple as you can see here x0 is a global minimum of the, of the difference if 0 is a subgradient. This is just an algebraic uh, uh, fact. Uh, follows immediately from the definition of the subdifferential. Now, the next step is using the formula we have just uh, obtained. 0 belongs to the intersection, means 0 belongs to every set in the family. And 0 belongs to a star difference, means the second set is contained in the first set. Or equivalently, we have inequality between the support functions. The support function of the epsilon subdifferential is the so-called epsilon directional derivative, which can be also expressed by means of this uh, infimum. Like in the case of convex functions, uh, I mean, like in the case of the exact directional derivative, epsilon equal to zero, 
if we take here x equal to 0 then we get an expression of directional derivative because for convex function this quotient without epsilon is uh, increasing with lambda so the limit is equal to the infimum I but have a comment here wait, wait, wait a second please but uh, here we have infimum but it's not the limit so again this is not a local notion even if it is called derivative we need global information to compute it it provides us with equivalent information as the epsilon sub differential which we have seen is not a local notion even for global for uh, for globally convex functions yes, please you uh, refer this paper to jb hiriaturuti but yes. as far as i have seen i'll me show you is that this uh, notion has already it was in, uh, in rockefeller's 1970 book which notion this g dash epsilon x not d no 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 i am referring to hiriaturuti for the optimality conditions oh, optimality conditions so this result that x0 is a global minimum of the difference if and only if the epsilon sub differential of h is contained in the epsilon sub differential of g for every epsilon this is due to iriart ruti and this uh, the citation here is for the first part not, not for the second part this equality here is well known for epsilon equal to 0 the directional derivative is the support function of the sub differential here we have an extension well now let us consider duality for uh, DC optimization problems with constraints. We are assuming here that both the objective function and the constraints are DC. But to avoid a um, very technical discussion on uh, constraint qualifications, I am going to avoid them by uh, considering an extra constraint, x belongs to k, in which k is a non-empty compact convex set. Thanks to it, we can avoid completely constraint qualifications. Here you have the precise functions on the, the functions we are considering and the convention which will be used in the formulas we are going to see. Then we have this complicated expression, which is the duality result. V of P means here the optimal value of the primal problem. And here you have a dual problem, which is expressed in terms of the conjugates of the data uh, well, here is not just the conjugate of the data, but the conjugate of a linear combination, but using an extra assumption, for instance, that all these functions are continuous at a common point of the domain, then we can replace this with that, which is really in terms of the conjugates of the original functions. Okay, this is a very complicated formula. And in fact, the dual problem is a mixture of minimization and maximization. You have an insuf expression. The original problem was minimization. But the, the interest of this problem is that it unifies uh, the most classical uh, non-convex duality theorem with the most classical convex duality theorem, namely uh, Tollanzinger for the non-convex case and Lagrange, Lagrangian duality for the convex case. If there are no constraints, it's very easy to see that this formula reduces to Tollanzinger duality. If there are constraints, but all the functions involved are, com are uh, convex, which means that h and the h sub i's are all equal to zero, then this formula reduces to the standard Lagrangian dual problem. Just two theoretical applications of this general formula. First, we consider the minimization of a DC function over a compact set, compact set which need not be convex. Okay, so this is our our problem. Yeah, the set C in P one is not convex anymore. The set C be. is compact, not it's convex. Compact, okay. So we are considering a very very general problem. Uh, in fact, it can be seen that the minimization of an arbitrary lower semi-continuous function over a uh, uh, compact set can be reformulated in this way. Okay, but then we can uh, replace this condition x belongs to C by this inequality, which is the C, because by the well-known formula due to Asplund, one half the distance to the set can be expressed as this difference of convex functions, 
okay and then now uh, to be able to apply our results in which there was the extra condition that x belongs to a compact convex set we have to consider here this extra condition x belongs to the convex hull of c c was compact so the convex hull of c now is compact and convex okay now we just apply the formula we have seen before and we have this expression which does not look as complicated as the one uh, for the general case for this very general problem of minimizing a DC function over compact set. Second theoretical application is uh, the problem of uh, linear programming with binary variables, 0, 1 variables. This is an important problem in applications. Uh, roughly speaking, every uh, combinatorial optimization problem can be reformulated uh, under this format. We are minimizing a linear function subject to in linear inequalities, but all variables must be 0, 1. Then this problem can be reformulated in this way. One can see that if instead of saying that each variable is either 0 or 1, we consider that each variable belongs to the closed interval 0 and 1, but then we add this extra condition, which is a DC inequality, linear minus convex, so actually concave. Okay. Then these two constraints are equivalent to this one, and then we have the problem reformulated with our format. Then we can immediately apply the general formula and obtain this exact duality result for uh, linear programming problems with 0, 1 variables. Of course, the right-hand side is non-convex. One cannot expect miracles. The 0, 1 linear programming problem is non-convex, so it has a non-convex dual. Okay? But nevertheless, the expression here does not look that complicated. And moreover, if you succeed to solve the problem, then uh, you can really have a solution of the primal problem. Because if we have an optimal solution of our problem, then this is one among all the optimal solutions of the minimization part of the dual problem. Okay, so if you succeed to solve the dual problem, you obtain a collection of optimal dual solutions, and then you know that this set of optimal dual solution contains at least one solution of the primal problem. In particular, if the uh, solution set of the dual problem is a singleton. That singleton is the singleton of the optimal solution of the primal problem. Yes. Can I go back to the previous slide? Uh, this is mm -hmm. very interesting, actually. To me. These are things I'm so interested in. Now, the P2 that you are forming here, P2, by adding this constraint by which you are replacing. No, the geometrically is very simple. Uh, half but this is e right e x e is the vector of ones huh. all ones okay 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 the, that constant would so look that in, is only true if in, in two is variables okay, in, zero and one. in two variables this is the unit square this is the feasible set the vertices okay mm. when what we are doing is re replacing this set of four points with the intersection of this set with this circle with the complement of this circle And the intersection is the set of vertices. Okay. Uh, just can I, uh, you, you can also prove this uh, algebraically in a very, very no, easy no, way. No, no, the second, that constant is true only, if and only if x is in 0 on n. Yes. That is clear. Okay. This together with the fact that the variables are between 0 and 1. Well, um, now I go to a more theoretical part, which is uh, characterizations of DC functions. There are two ways of looking at DC functions. First, as I observed before, DC functions are local ellipses. So it's natura natural to look for characterizations of DC functions within the set of local ellipses functions. And the tool for this would be the Clark generalized gradient. But another point of view is we also know that these functions are uh, directionally differentiable. Then how to characterize these functions in the larger set of directional differentiable functions? And to answer this question, the most reasonable tool is the quasi-differential. Uh, 
defined a long time ago by Demjanov and Rubinov. I will present some results in the setting of Banach spaces and I will uh, mention the differences with the finite dimensional case. Well, first of all, I recall here the definition of um, quasi differentiability, which basically says that the one sided directional derivative, which is always positively homogeneous, can be expressed as a difference of two convex and positively homogeneous, that is to say, sublinear functions. Then those functions as support of uh, compact convex sets in this case with the weak star topology and then uh, these two sets of which the support functions appeared in the expression for the derivative are called the pair formed by these uh, two sets is called the quasi differential of the function at the point. And a function is said to be quasi differentiable if it is so at every point in the domain. The first set in the quasi differential would be called the subgrade, the subdifferential, and the second set, the super differential. The, the set of quasi differentiable functions is very large. It contains all DC functions, it's quite clear, but it also contains all differentiable functions. Then it contains many functions which are not DC. So, how to characterize these functions in terms of the quasi differential? Uh, to obtain this characterization, we need to recall the notion of cyclic monotonicity, which is well known in convex analysis because um, it's used to characterize subdifferentials. And in the finite dimensional case, so for functions defined on subsets of Rn, we have this characterization. A function is DC if and only if it is quasi differentiable everywhere, and the quasi differential is such that. Both the subdifferential and the superdifferential are restrictions to the domain of the function of maximal cyclically monotone multivalued functions that contain omega in their domains. This is uh, if and only if, so it is a characterization. But it's true only in the finite dimensional case. To see what happened in the general uh, Banach space case, we need first this lemma, which can be proved easily using Hambanach theorem, which says that if we have a difference of two proper convex functions, then you can get a similar representation, which is so-called normalized. Normalized means that the second function is non-negative and vanishes at a pre-specified point. Then, using this uh, theorem, we uh, can obtain this important result, which says that whenever you have a DC function which is continuous, then in the DC decomposition you can take the two terms continuous too. As a consequence, continuous DC functions are local ellipses because continuous convex functions are local ellipses. And then we have here the infinite dimensional version of the result we saw below, which says the same, the same but with the difference that you need here f to be continuous, not only this e but continuous. And uh, under this extra assumption you have exactly the same as before, but you need continuity. Yes? I'm just reading. The yeah. It's the same result as we saw before. The only difference is continuous here. Without continuity, we cannot do anything. And this is to be compared with a much older result by obtained by El Hilal Alawi long time ago, in which DC functions are characterized in the set of local Lipschitz functions using the Clark generalized gradient. One needs the space to be separable. And the characterization is this one. F is DC if and only if the Clark gradient is contained in the difference, algebraic difference, Minkowski difference of two um, maximal cyclically monotone uh, mappings which contain omega, the domain of the function, in their domains. Now, uh, the, the last part of my talk will be about Lipschitz continuity. Everything will follow from uh, an inter uh, a result which I find very interesting, not by the result itself, 
but uh, because of the proof which uh, unfortunately I have not time to tell you now but the proof the difficult part of the proof uses a very uh, interesting technique invented by a young uh, Czech student, Pavel Kotsourek. Um, well, this result says that all these five statements are equivalent. The only uh, a priori assumption is that the two functions we are dealing with are uh, defined on a common domain, which is non-empty and convex, no other assumptions. Then we have that using an extra function h, which is assumed to be continuous and convex and vanishing at the origin, then the two functions are convex and lower semi-continuous on their domain and satisfy this inequality if and only if each of these uh, and then all of them of these results uh, hold. Well, all these results or these statements are expressed in terms of the approximate subdifferentials, the epsilon subdifferentials of the involved functions. And most of the implications are easy. One can make a circular proof. Some implications of ob are obvious. Two in place three is obvious because two and three are the same statement, one for every epsilon, the second only for sufficiently small epsilon. Also, three implies five is obvious because this intersection would be the smaller set, which is assumed to be non-empty. In the same way, 2 implies 4 is obvious, and 4 implies 5 is obvious. So to complete the proof, we only need to imply 1 implies 2, which is a quite easy uh, convex analytic proof, and 5 implies 1, which is where the technique by Pavel Kotsourek does the job. H is any convex continuous function vanishing at zero. If we take uh, this function to be identically equal to zero, then we get these equivalences. The two functions are convex and lower semi-continuous and coincide up to an additive constant. If and only if we have two or we have three or we have four or we have five. The interesting implication here is five implies one. Because just assuming that the epsilon subdifferentials always intersect for sufficiently small epsilon, we conclude it's an integration result. First of all, that the two functions are convex and lower semi-continuous, and then that they are the same up to an additive constant. Also, if you want a result with uh, just subdifferentials, not approximate subdifferentials, then here is the result. Again, this is an integration result because assuming one of these conditions, we get that the functions are convex, lower semi-continuous, and their difference is constant. Uh, here, the interesting implication is 2 in place 3 because just assuming that the intersection of these subdifferentials is not empty everywhere, you get equality or you get the fact that the two functions are identical up to an additive constant. This follows immediately from the first result. We are talking about the Lipschitz condition. The Lipschitz condition appears when we take h equal to be k times the norm. k is the Lipschitz constant. Then we have all these equivalences. Uh, this follows immediately from the general theorem by just computing the epsilon subdifferential of the norm at the origin, which turns out to be the unit ball in the dual space. Well not the unit ball, the ball with radius k and center at the origin. Okay, So this is just up to statement 5, an immediate application of the general theorem. But we have here two more statements which appear to be weaker than the previous ones. If you look at 5, for instance, 5 says that there is a point here and a point there such that the difference is, the, is in the ball. That is to say, such that the difference has a norm less than or equal to k. Then the distance between the two sets is less than or equal to k, but this is apparently weaker because the distance need not be attained. Okay? Nevertheless, it turns out to be equivalent. So it's interesting to notice that you just need the distance between the epsilon subdifferentials to be less than or equal to k for sufficiently small epsilon to be sure that your DC function f minus j is Lipschitz with constant k. Another interesting observation is that 
some of the statements here are uh, symmetric. For instance, one, f minus g is Lipschitz if and only if g minus f is Lipschitz. The same with many others, but not. This is not the case with statement two and statement three, but because they are equivalent, then we get the symmetry, which means we can interchange f and g here and here everywhere. 